Good morning, everybody. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, a reminder that we and ECA will be closed on Friday for Easter uh, weekend. So uh, hopefully you're taking that off as well. And then Jerry just had a few interesting updates that um, he wanted to talk to you about. And this is some, uh, some I think, very unique things that would, would uh, really attract new clients. So Jerry, what's going on? Hey, good morning, guys. Just a second here. We'll get my get my screen going here. Can you see the rates? I do not. I see how to join the join. webinar. There we go. Now there we go. Right here. Now, <laughs> there we now we get now it. Okay. All yeah. right. Perfect. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, guys. Yeah, I do got some interesting updates. There's always uh, insurance carriers are always coming up with new and unique things. So I always love to get these things out to you right away and share them with you. And one of those things is from a carrier we've talked about in, in the past, which is uh, Lincoln Financial Group, you know, highly A-rated carrier. So pretty much everybody, no matter uh, you know where you're coming from, whether you're insurance licensed, you're an RA or a registered rep, there's not gonna be issues here for you on this. And one of the things I wanna point out, so in the past when we've talked about Lincoln here, and I hope you can see this pretty good, but one of the things that I've kind of liked and talked about in the past with Lincoln is their trigger, their performance trigger. Okay, so if I make this a little bigger here, um, the performance trigger, for those of you who aren't aware of how that works, if you can see right here on the uh, on the 10-year product here, performance trigger from the on the S&P 500, how it works is it's annual point to point, and then the performance trigger on the 10-year version of the product is 9%. So all that works is if the market is flat or better, during that one year period time, they automatically credit you that 9%. So it can be a really cool in strategy. I, I have a lot of people that when they'll, they'll come to me, they'll be like, yeah, you know, I don't really, I'm not really feeling the market's going to be real good. So maybe we want to be in, be in a fixed rate. Well, great. The nice thing is they do have a fixed rate of four and a half percent built in that you can flip in and out of. But the trigger method is great because you don't need returns to be able to get a great return of 9%. You think about S&P 500, over the last hundred years, including dividends, was around like nine, nine and a half percent, some somewhere around there. So to be able to get that and not have to have the big return, it's a fun strategy to be able to have because you know when you have flat markets or kind of topsy turvy, not a lot of confidence, performance trigger is great. All right, so most of you, you've heard of that, and we talked about that. That's not what I'm I'm here to talk about. That's just one great feature of it. They came out with something called a dual trigger. So what the heck is a dual trigger? So right here, the dual trigger rates are right here. We got the one year S&P 500 dual trigger. Now the dual trigger is seven and a half percent. So it better give me some sort of a benefit if I'm gonna take, you know, have the cap rate be one and a half percent less than the 9%. So the dual trigger, how it works is, you know, obviously if the market's flat or better, you get the seven and a half, but if it goes negative, they're going to give you the difference between the negative amount and what that cap is. So as example, we have a 7.5% dual trigger. If the market is negative 2.5, they're going to credit you 5. So if it's negative 2.5, they're going to credit you 5. If it's negative 5, well, that leaves us 2.5% left. We accredited 2.5%. So Kind of the neat thing about this is, is for those of you like who have thought of like inverse triggers or things like that, like, hey, wouldn't that be great if I could get a return if it was negative? Hey, here's a way where you can still get, you get the trigger option if things are positive or better. And you also have the opportunity to get returns still if the market's a little bit negative. So it's protecting you even more to be able to give you a bit of return. So if you're, you know, if you're concerned about, hey, you know, I'm not sure if the markets do great, maybe I should get in a fixed account. The dual trigger might be the one for you to look at because even if it's negative, there's still opportunity to get some nice return on that. So they have that on their five, their seven, and their 10-year product. And if you have questions, reach out to myself, Dan, or Nate. But I do have one other item I want to bring it real quickly here too as well. They uh, they introduced another, that's, that's unique. There isn't another product I've seen out there that has the dual trigger that Lincoln has there. One other unique item they have is they have right here, this is a one-year S&P 500, 10% daily risk control trigger. All right, so what is that? So that's one of the volatility control indexes that are out there. 
one of the things I do like about it is it's based off of the S&P 500. And so we, we do at least know if the S&P 500 was doing good and there wasn't a lot of volatility, then it's gonna be heavy in the S&P position. And a 10% volatility control basically means it's allowing it to stay in an equity position twice as much longer than most of the other volatility indexes out there. But here's where um, I think having a volatility control trigger is cool is, this is the only vol control index I've seen out there that has a trigger on it. Why is that important? Why is it a big deal? I know there's a lot of you, and I'm, I'm speaking to, to a choir of you, that you've had some experiences or your clients have where you've had some volatility controls and maybe the, the markets were doing pretty good and, and you didn't get a great return or you got nothing. And that's, that's, that's disappointing. Sometimes that can be something that can be a little bit difficult to be able to explain to a client because the, the moving parts, the more complicated to get, the harder it is for people to understand. Totally get it. Where this is actually uh, intriguing to me is they give you a 10.5% trigger on it. And I don't have to get a lot of return for it to return well. I just need it to be flat or better for me able to get that 10 and a half. So unlike a lot of volatility control triggers where they're showing some great return that has to actually do that, this is what I don't, it doesn't really actually have to return real well for me to get the 10 and a half percent return. So it, to me, that makes a volatility control um, that I don't really maybe understand how it works real well, more attractive than all the other ones out there because it doesn't need, I don't need it to, to return a lot to give me the 10 and a half percent. And it is the first time we've seen a trigger on a vol control. So it might be something, you know, really cutting edge um, for those vol controls um, for them to be able to do that. So just a couple, this isn't a new product, by the way, guys, not a new product. This is the Lincoln Opti Blend 5, 7, and 10. Many of you guys use it, but they added new indexes. So the, again, the new indexes are uh, are the the dual performance trigger, and then the the performance trigger on their volatility controlled index. Okay, so so two things. So if you're interested in those, if you want the rate sheet, if you want some more information, heck, if you want an illustration, go ahead and give us a call. Just wanted to make sure this just came out. Wanted to make sure it was in everybody's hands. You guys are all aware of it and uh, maybe have someone that you think it would be a good fit for. But um, there's been a lot of great options coming out here. This is just another one of those. Um, you know, it's a, it's a great time to be out talking about annuities. And uh, that's that's all I got today, Mike. Thank you, Jerry. Those are two great options. And, and the one thing I like about these things is if um, – is nobody – uh, is else is talking about those right now. So when you get out to talk to clients about these things, everybody loves unique things, whether they do it or not, they want to know you're on top of your game. But, but I guess the biggest question I would have is why do we even need to do FIAs? I mean, right now the market's on a tear right now, the market's on a tear. Why would we even bother doing an FIA? How are your, uh, how are your, um, uh, equity accounts doing, doing fantastic, right? So this is something I continually show people, and it's probably been about almost a year since I've shown this to you, uh, but I think it's something that's uh, um, worth thinking about. So first of all, how many people know when to get in or out of the market? What percentage of people, what percentage of experts know how, what, when to get in and out of the market to get the highest rate of return. Know when to sell, know when to buy. Yeah, none, I mean, none. I and mean, what's Warren Buffett say? Buy like you're gonna hold for how many years? 10 years. So that means, should we get out early or should we get out late? Because we know we can't get out on time, but should we get out early or should we get out late? Well. If you look at all of them, I mean, I went and I, I tried to find this slide, but um, all the huge investment uh, gurus like Bernard Baruch, I mean, all the way down to back 150 years, and I had quote after quote after quote after quote. And uh, actually, we use this quote in the FI presentation because Warren Buffett says it is too. The best way to become wealthy is to make sure you never what? The best way to become wealthy is make sure you never what? Lose money, right? No, and nobody can do that, but we can, can't we, with FIAs? So I wanted to walk through this. This is from a few years back, but it looks at the two um, two major downturns. And 
We're going to talk a little bit about whether we can see it. Well, first of all, in the news right now, could we have a major downturn based on how many things are in the, in the news? Do we have loose cannons in this country? Do we have loose cannons uh, across the ocean? Do we have on, on one side of the ocean? Do we have loose cannons on the other side of the ocean? Taiwan, Ukraine, the upcoming election. I mean, just those things, right? And so we don't know what is going to happen. And if any of those things do happen, we know, we know what will happen to the market. So I want you to, to, to walk through this again. It's a little bear experiment. Let's do a hypothetical comparison. On one side, we're going to put $100,000 in the S&P 500 with reinvested dividends and no fees. So with reinvested dividends and no fees. Because that's the one uh, complaint that a lot of, I hear a lot of times. But there's, you're not counting reinvested dividends. No, it has reinvested dividends and no fees. But we know this. First of all, how many uh, advisors are using the S&P 500 index with no fees? Yeah. So on the other We'll place 100,000 in a fixed annuity that credits the interest based on the S&P 500 without, without reinvested dividends. We'll place a 5% cap on the annual interest credited. So are we being wild and crazy here or are we being a little conservative here with a 5% cap? I just put a million dollars in, the, in a, um, uh, with a 11% cap here a few, few months ago. So is this a conservative or wild and crazy is 5% cap? C for conservative, wild, W for wild and crazy, unattainable. Yeah, it's conservative. So we'll use a five-year period because FIAs are available uh, with money. Uh, so there are five-year contracts out there. So let's see what happens. Oops. Well, first of all, like we said, we don't know, uh, don't know what's going to happen in the future. And I, I, the reason I have this in here is, guys, guess what I had on my desk for when I'm talking to clients about the market? I had a crystal ball on my desk. I had a crystal ball on my desk. So it's a small one. I like this one if you got enough room. But what, what am I doing with the crystal ball? That's also part of the FIA presentation. Do we know, does any of our, do we know, if somebody tells you they know what's going to happen in the future, we know they're what? Full of beans. How do we know they're full of beans? I don't care if they've got an algorithm. I don't care if it's some sort of program. I don't care if they think there's some sort of genius. If they know what's going to happen in the market, what's their minimum client size? Yeah, 500 million. That's right. So I, I would highly recommend that you invest in a crystal ball. It's a great prop. It's a great prop to have on your desk. But let's go back to this. So let's go back to the crash of 2008. And let's look at how getting out early would have maybe helped you. If your crystal ball was working well, you'd have gotten out of the market at the end of 2007. So all of a sudden, you, you do. You got it. You nailed it. You get out in 2007. Get out in 2007. If you'd stayed in, you'd have watched $100,000 drop to 62000 uh, 62, However, if you'd stayed the course, you watched your investment rebound due to the three years of strong double-digit uh, returns and end up with $108,000 in 2012. So, if you'd stayed in, you went down, right? And then you ended up back up at what? 108,000. How many years later? One, two, three, four years later. The FI didn't get those uh, big numbers since it had a 5% cap, but since it was still worth 100,000, even the depths of the crash, the FI finishes at what? 115. But let's say instead, so first of all, who's happier? The people that after one, two, three, four years, who's happier? The FIA with a 5% cap or the people who bought and held? Because we know how many people got out at 119,000? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to talk about that here in a second. So um, now let's say you got out too early and switched to the FIA at the end of 2006. So you got out here. And put it in FIA 2006. That's a good call. Because by the end of the five years, you would have been at what? 114. If you'd stayed in the market, you would have been at what? 98. Who's happier? FIA or stayed in the market? FIA stayed in the market. 
But then let's say, you know what, this time you really blew it. You got out two years early in 2005. Got out in 2005. Oh my gosh, look at the market continue to go up, go up, go up, go up. I'm not making nearly the capped at five, capped at five. Oh my God. And then the market fell. So at the end of that five year period, who's happier? The 119 that it was in the FIA or the 111 who stayed in and bought and hold? Well, yeah, Dale brings up, and who slept a lot better during those five years? And that's not including the client. Would, why would you have slept better during those five years as well? What does a client ask you every, if this happened to you, if you bought and hold, what's the client asking you every single year? Why am I paying your fee? You lost me money. You're still charging me a fee, and I'm not even, it takes, it's taken five years to get to back, around, back to ground even, you're paying a fee. So that's the 2008. What about the 2000? Well, let's say you got out in 1999. That's good because that your 100,000 would have plummeted to 62,000 before the uh, finally recovering back to 88,000 by the end of 2004. That's five years, and after five years, did they get back to ground even? If you bought and hold, didn't even get back to ground even. By contrast, at the end of the same five year period, the FI has accumulated 110,000. So what's better, 88 or 110? What's better, 88,000 buy and hold, 110 with a FI with a 5% cap, which is extremely conservative in today's world. What if you jumped the gun a little bit early and you got out in 98 and moved over to an FIA? Once again, 110 versus buy and hold at 97. FIA 110, buy and hold at 97. Didn't even get back to ground even. What if you pulled uh, two years in advance, two years in advance, like, oh my gosh, look it, it's, it's going up and up and up and I'm missing out on it, I'm missing out, I'm missing out on it. Boom. So you're feeling the uh, uh, touch of buyer's remorse as you watch this by 500 with the dividends at 28% uh, in 1998, 21% in 1999, while your FI just pokes along at 5% and 5%. However, at the end of that five year period, the investment has given all back all those gains. So you're back to 97, where the FIA would be at 110. Who would be happier? So if you're working with a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, 40-year-old, it doesn't matter. No, because they'll get it back. But if you're working with somebody who's retired, are they trying to become wealthy or do they want to make sure? Of, of these charts, oops, this chart here, and this chart here, whose lifestyle hasn't changed? If you're in the gray here, which is the market, buy and hold, has their lifestyle changed? If you're in a buy and hold, has their lifestyle changed if they're in these gray um, uh, market buy and hold strategies? Has their lifestyle changed if they're retired? Are they going out to eat as much? Are they going on vacation as much? Are they uh, buying a new car as often as they bought a new car? Say yay or nay, I wanna hear and see you guys. Yes or no, are they doing these things? Has the, or has their um, lifestyle changed? Yes, their lifestyle changes, why? No, their lifestyle, I got one, two, come on. Guys, has their lifestyle changed? Only two people say yes? If they're in the gray here, how many people will lose 30% of their market in, the, in their investments and not make lifestyle changes? So everybody's agreeing now. Yes, their lifestyle has changed. But if they're in the FIA here, did their lifestyle ever change? Or, or were they still living the exact same life they always did? Buying the cars they want, going out to vacation when they want, going out to eat the same amount as they were before. See, when people retired, are they trying to become wealthy or are they trying to maintain their lifestyle? Same thing here. Let's talk about this one right here. How many of your clients would say, oh, I'm way up here. I can go buy a new house. I can buy two houses now. I can buy a Lamborghini now. How many people change their lifestyles when they have great returns? No, but when they're retired, they don't do that. But how many people change their lifestyles when they have this kind of drastic downturn? They all do. See, I've said it before. If you work with retirees, you're in the business that you can never make, even if you don't work with retirees. We're in the business that we can never make people happy. Because no, I don't care how much you made this year, what do they always think? Or what do they always bring up to you? Could have made more. 
They're never, or if they if they are happy, how long do they remain happy? They come into your office, you show them they made, uh, like right here, you show them they made uh, 21%, you show them they made 28%, how long are they happy? I mean, if they find out they're getting a divorce, if they find out their daughter's getting a divorce, if they find out that um, their favorite uh, uh, dog died, I mean, do, do they say, well, at least I'm, I'm making a ton of money in the market? No. See, they're not very happy. They're happy until they walk out of the office and then life hits them again because the market does not affect – when the market's going up, it does not affect their everyday life. But when the market goes down 30%, does it affect their everyday life? Because what's on the news every day? What is on the news every single day? What the market did. So if they're down 30%, what are they reminded of every single day? See, when the market's up, when they're up and the market's up, they, it only uh, they um, think, oh good, Dad, you know, I'm, I'm probably doing okay. But when they're down 30, 40, 50 percent, and the, and the market says, uh, you know, is talking about what's happening in the market. I mean, they're reminded every day that they're screwed and it changes their 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 whole lifestyle. See, that's a problem. Now, why am I talking about this? Well. Those of you that have been with me a long time know that I love the Schiller PE, the CAPE, the Schiller PE. It has an unbelievable uh, uh, record, 100 years old, of, of predicting not now, but what the market will give you over the next 10 years. Not each year, but in general, over the next 10 years. So right now, this is just at the last 20 years. How much overbought right now According to, according to company earnings, according to company earnings, how much overbought is the market right now? So the implied, the implied rate of return, annual average rate of return for the next 10 years is 2.4% based on how high the market is right now. And that's based on pr uh, price earnings ratios. 2.4%. How, how happy are your clients now? It's not going to be 2.4 next year, 2.4 the following year, 2.4, 2.4, 2.4. The likelihood, in order to get a 2.4 average, what's the likelihood of what's going to happen? Same thing that happened in 1999 and the same thing that happened in 2007, which is what? The market's going to have a huge crash, and then it will start to come back over the next 10 years. So... We don't know exactly what's going to happen. We don't know if it's going to be a great 10 years, bad 10 years, but here's where we're at. So with the Shilla P where it's at right now, if we're really, really lucky and all the stars are aligned, you can expect a 7.5% rate. That's it. That's if you're, everything happened perfectly. What's the likelihood that's going to happen based on the fact we just went through a decade of record earnings? If you're lucky, you're going to average a 5.2%. Reverse to mean, which is just to be average. If it's just average, that's where we come up with that two and a half percent rate of return. This is not uh, this is an annual rate of return, two and a half percent per year. If you're unlucky, 0.9. If you're really unlucky, negative 5.5. If you showed this chart to your clients, how many retired clients would want to be in the market right now? And guys, this again, this is this is the Cape PE has been right over and over and over. And, and, and again, it's right. Why? Why is it right? Because it's based on what are the prices of stocks compared to what those companies are earning? So it's not just it's, it's based on and what's the likelihood all these companies are going to be uh, ten times better earnings than they are right now for the next ten years, high or low? So what am I saying here? I'm saying that if if you if your clients have had a good run up on the market. What would be a good technique? What would be a good investment technique to use right now if your clients have had a good run-up in the market? Starts with an R. What would be if your clients had a good run-up in the market? What would be a good investment technique to do right now? Starts with an R. Yes, Alfred, uh, uh, Fred's got it. Rebalance. Thank you, Mr. Hicks. Yep, rebalance. Get back to a 50-50. 40, 60, 30, 70. And remember, when we look at the, at the uh, Kitsis research on retirees, if we're looking at a 30-year time frame, how much money should people have in the marketplace to begin that 30-year time frame? 
to get the biggest bang for the buck, they should have 30% stocks, 70% guaranteed, and then be rebalancing each year into more and more equities. But right now, should you be putting more money into equities? Now, here's the funny thing. When do clients want to put in de- money into equities? When do people want to put money into equities? Right now. Yeah, everybody wants to do it now. Why? Because, oh, geez, the market. And that's your job as advisors to change that. Make sense? Okay. So today I want to talk about uh, how we can make the 21-point checklist work even better. Now, uh, if you follow the 21-point checklist, you're going to get a 94% closing ratio. Follow those scripts, 94% closing ratio. Why? Why do we get a 94% closing ratio with the 21-point checklist? See if anybody's on their game this morning. Why do we get a 94%? We really get 100%, but 6% of the people we say we don't want to work with them. Why do we have, and when people, when somebody first looks at my system, they say, well, how can you guarantee that? And I'll walk them through some of the scripts. I'll walk them through some of the scripts, and then I'll ask them what? Why do we have, why do they not even need to listen to a tape to make sure that they understand that we get a 94% closing ratio? Well, Nick uh, says, no uh, selling, telling, preaching, or teaching. That's right. Here's the thing. If a client tells themselves, and we, every week we look at one of these scripts, if a client tells themselves 21 times, 16 times, 12 times, that their guy, remember, at the end of every the financial script, I say, okay, what did you want? Did you want this or that? I wanted this, but you got what? I got that. And you want to pay high fees or low fees? I wanted low fees. And what are you paying? high fees. So you wanted this and low fees. Instead, you got what? I got that and high fees. And why did that happen? So the advisor can make money on me. Guys, if they say that 10, 12, 16 times, what percentage is your closing ratio? If they say that 10, 12 times, what is it? it's 100%. That's right. It's 100%. And guys, after every single script, what do I ask you? Could, would a client answer any differently than Jeff answered? And what do you always tell me? The way these scripts are set up, the way the questions are asked, will a client answer any differently than Jeff? No, they will not. That's why we have such a high ratio. But the problem is, how do we get them? How do we get them to the 21-point checklist so we can have that kind of closing ratio? Because that's the second meeting. So how do we get them there? We have to get them there from the agreement meeting. We need to get them to opt in to the whole process. If we want that 94% closure ratio or 100% closure ratio, we need to get them to opt in to the process. So how do we do that? We need to get them to keep showing up. We need them to come to the second meeting. Well, we have the agreement meeting. The first part is setting the tone. So how long, I'm going through this because a lot of people don't, uh, that are learning the 20 point checklist script, uh, forget they have to go back and learn or you know, be proficient at this agreement meeting as well. First part is setting the tone. Second part is gathering data. Third part is the goal script. Fourth part is the close. So we want to quickly walk through these again. So the, the agreement script uh, uh, outline is, again, setting the tone. We address any questions and how we're paid. Then we gather the data. Then we set the hook and give them five reasons to come back. And then we have them tell us why they're coming back. So let's walk through this. When we set the tone, we say, is it okay if I share with you what happens in the next hour or so? How many people say, no, I don't want that? Then we answer any questions. And what are the two questions that most people have? What's going to happen today? And how much do you cost? Well, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about how much we're going to get paid. And then I get the permission to record. So let's look at this. I say, would it be okay if I gave you an idea of what generally happens in the next hour or so? What does everybody say to that? Does anybody say, no, no, surprise me? No, they all say, what? Sure. They say, first of all, I'm going to get some questions. Uh, uh, you've got some questions from the workshop or from the mailer or from whatever reason they came. But is everyone on your block the same or different? What does everybody say to that? No, they say, no, everybody's different. That's right. And do people want one size fits all solutions or do they want a solution tailored specifically to them? Again, how many people say, no, I want one that fits perfectly? They all do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. So I know you have questions and I want to give you the great answers that are tailored to you in your situation. So would it be okay if I find out a little bit about you before we get into your questions? And what is every, does that seem reasonable, guys? So far, is everything in here, are they going to say exactly like, like they're supposed to answer? And do I seem like a salesman or do I seem like I'm reasonable? They say, super, because they're going to say, sure, no, that's fine. 
Super. First, as a reminder, this is a complimentary meeting. And I understand that as someone is retired, you've got a lot going on. You're probably busier than, than when you were when you're working. So you, you are busy, whether it's your hobbies, your friends, your family. So the fact that you took a couple of hours off to come to my event, or whether, you know, again, you're going to fit it to whatever type of marketing you're doing. I really appreciate that. For people that are willing to do that, as a thank you, I give them an hour of my personal time. So what am I doing here, guys? I'm saying my time is what? Hey, there's no obligation. When I say, hey, there's no obligation for this meeting, then what does that sound about my time if I say there's no obligation for this meeting? If I instead say this is a complimentary meeting that I give as a thank you, because you, took, you invested your time, I will invest my time in you. What am I saying about my personal time? It is what? Valuable. If, they say, if we say it's no obligation, yes, you're right. That means it's worthless. But if I say complimentary meeting, and it's a, a thank you, because I know you invested your time, I will invest time in you, that shows that my time is valuable. So that's why we're here today. To be honest with you, about half the people come to see us, they end up working with us long-term, one shape, or form, or manner. We may help them with investments, estate planning, whatever it may be. They'll pay us in any number of ways. So right there, I've said, what? If somebody tries to pin me down for how much it's going to cost, what would I say? Well, it depends on what shape, form, or manner I work with you. Is it going to be long-term, short-term? Is it going to, am I going to do one thing or two things for you? Are we going to work on your estate planning or investment? So until I know more about you, I can't exactly tell you exactly what. So have I covered my bases where they can not pin me down? If I do this up front, can they pin me down for how much it's going to cost? Say, well, I'd love to tell you how much it's going to cost, I, uh, d but it depends on what. What shape for a man you work with me and what exactly I do for you. But here's the funny thing. After I say that, they don't never ask how much it's going to cost because I say, oops. So, uh, and what they choose to do, to do with us and how much we do for them. But about half the people, just like you are sitting here today, we help them at no cost because they just need a simple adjustment to actually go home and do it themselves. They're all, we're always willing to help people they call and have questions. So I first say, hey, here's how we're paid. Depends on the shape, form, or manner, and what we do for you. But half the people, just like you are sitting here today, we help them at no cost. We give them some simple adjustments, and they go home and do it themselves. Why do I cover that? Uh, uh, instead of starting with that, why do I end with that? Because people remember what you start with, or people remember what you end with? Start or end? People remember what you end with, the last thing that you say. And why do I want them to think they're going to be the people that can go home and do it themselves? I want them to think that. In, in the first two minutes of the meeting, I want them to think they're one of those people that I'm going to give the information to, and they go home. What does that do to their, their defense level? What does it do to their, their, uh, their wall of resistance when I do that? And, say, and just like you're sitting here today, about half the people end up taking this home. Do they become more ramped up and anxious or more solid? Have I given them a reason that, hey, you can go home, no problem, I'll have the people just like you're sitting here today take this. See, it drops their guard. Does that make sense? And I say, now, have you ever seen a situation where two people hear things differently? This is where I'm going to get them to opt in and let me record. And guys, why do I, why do I record? Why do I highly, 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 highly recommend you record? Why does it, to learn, that's right, Nick, is, when um, the coach tells the, the defensive tackle that he missed a tackle on Sunday, what's that defensive tackle say? No, I didn't. I don't, he might not say it out loud, but what's he say in his head? No, I didn't. So what, what did the coach do on Monday? What does every professional and college football team do on Monday or the following day after the game? They watch the film. Because the only way you're going to get better is to do, is see what? What you think you did right or what an actual – see, the film doesn't lie. Recordings don't lie. If you want to get better at your skills, if you want to get better at your profession, you have to record yourself. The reason the, – there's one and only one reason that I went from making 50 grand a year to a million a year in three years is because I recorded my meetings. Because when you record, you can't make excuses. You hear what actually happened. So how do you get a client to opt into that? I say, have you ever been to a situation where two people hear two completely different things? And they both insist that what they heard was right. You know, you and your wife go to a, a party and you say, do you believe what Bob said? And she says, he didn't say that. Yeah, he did. No, he didn't. Yeah, he did. Can people be, be at the same place and hear two totally different things? Yes. 
But when it comes to family, when it comes to health, when it comes to money, how important is it that we get these things right? Yeah, well, it's very important. Yes, exactly. And because of that, I don't want any mistakes. Could I ask you a favor? Well, sure, sure. I found the best way for me to really listen, pay attention, and get things correct is to record these meetings. I used to take notes, but I found that the more worried I was about writing, I became more worried about writing notes and listening. Now, like I record so I don't get anything wrong. So many of my clients love it because I can also email them that recording they want as well. In fact, a lot of physicians now do that. Would it be okay if I record the meeting to make sure I get things right? And if you want the recording, I can get that to you so you can remember what was said. What percentage of people say no to that? Those of you that have done this, what percentage of people say no? I don't want you to record. High or low? I think I, in three years, I had maybe three people tell me they weren't okay with that. I just want to make sure I don't miss anything. Does that make sense? Yes. Thanks. I'll, uh, and just remind me again if you want the recording. Of this. And when I say I'll give you a copy of that, what does it sound like? I'm, I'm uh, going to use this against them or it's, it's for everybody's benefit when I say I'll give you a copy of this. Now, nobody ever asked for a copy of it, but I offer that because when you do that, it shows that what? One party is trying to get a leg up in the other party or it's just purely information. It's just purely information. Does that make sense? So now when I, data, uh, when I gather data, Here's the thing. I just simply gather the data. Do I ever make given an opinion? Do I ever give an opinion on their investments? Yeah, we don't like this variable annuity. We think it's too, the, that it's not performing very well. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, I never wanted to invest this, but it seems like the guy kind of sold me it. What do I say when they say that? Hmm. Huh. Well, that's interesting. Yeah, I'm not, you know, there's a lot of good variable news out there. I'm not really sure how this one works, but yeah, I'll take a look at it. But, you know, I don't see anything on the surface where it's extremely bad. But, I, you know, obviously it's a concern of yours. I'll go ahead and look at that. Did I give an opinion on that or did I just kind of brush it off? Because if I give an opinion on it, if I jump, it, see, because here's what the client's doing at that point. When they start saying, I don't like my advisor, he doesn't communicate well, I don't like this investment, here's what they're doing. They're fishing. They throw out the bait. And then, they, and then they start to lure the bait in. Clickety, 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 clickety. And then when they say something bad about their investments or their advisor and you jump on board, they go, they, they've set the hook. What if you just confirm for them, if they say something bad about their advisor, something bad about their investments, and you jump on board, what if you just confirm for them that you're an advisor or that you're a salesperson? That you're a salesperson. So they're fishing to see, can I catch this guy to find out what he really is? And if you jump on board and start hammering, see, because what most people that aren't trained by, most advisors that aren't trained by 5Q, when they hear a, a client complain, what do they do? Aha, I'm going to jump on. Oh, you, you don't like your advisor to communicate? I communicate with my clients all the time. I can't believe that's You know, that's one of the things that says to me in this industry is when advisors don't c c communicate. That's the most important thing. When I do that, I, that and that's what advisors do. When I do that, do I sound like a what? A salesman. We do not want to do that. So when we gather data, that's all we do. We simply gather data. The first page of the data gathering form does not have to be memorized. This is just an example of how, so you don't need to do this. This should be memorized. You should do these. Why should you memorize a script? Because if you ask these questions, the exact way I'm having you ask them there, they will say the exact thing that they're supposed to say. But with gathering data, all we're doing is find out what they have. We're not trying, we have no uh, motivation here because where we're going to get them to move forward is with the goals. We're going to create insatiable curiosity for them. And we're going to get the commitment because that's what transforms a promise into reality. So where we do that, where we talk about the goals is the data gathering form. And what we do is please circle these. And again, we don't give this to a client. We're actually filling it out for them as they talk. So we ask them, um, what are your, if I can ask you what your goals are. First of all, I want to pass on as much as possible to my children and heirs. Not concerned, not very concerned, somewhat very or most concerned. Now, this is a throwaway question here. We're, the only reason we ask that question is if it's an easy life insurance sale. If they say, yeah, I'm very concerned with that, then we know that's an easy life insurance sale. But what, uh, what percentage of people say that their number one concern is passing assets on to their kids? High percentage or virtually nobody? 
mean, people ride around with bumper stickers saying in crappy cars saying, I'm driving this crappy car because I'm actually saving my money for my kids. Or do they put a bumper sticker on their $300,000 mobile home saying I'm spending my kids uh, uh, inheritance? Because if, if everybody was concerned, if everybody was concerned about this, and we had a lot of people concerned about passing on as much as possible, how much life insurance would be selling? Every time we sat down, somebody would be doing what? Because what is the best way to pass money on to your kids? Life insurance. So if this is real, but so all I'm looking for is is those two or three people a year who say, yeah, this is important. Then I say, oh, good, I have a chance at a life insurance sale. And because life insurance is so profitable, that's terrific. But that's not what most people uh, are concerned about. But then we get on to, I want to make sure my money lasts through my lifetime. How many people are concerned about that? Say, so how about, uh, um, now without, what if I can, then when we, uh, they answer these questions, I want to make sure my money lasts through a lifetime. I would like to ensure that my assets are protected from losses. I want to pay less taxes. I would like to protect my family from catastrophic long-term care costs. I would like more income. So let's look at how we deal with those things. How about making sure that your money lasts your lifetime without changing, without changing a single investment, without moving any of your investments, but instead using what you already have, there are different ways you can create uh, income. One way is to increase your income by 25 to doubling your income, 25% to doubling your income with less chance of running out of money. So here's the funny thing though, are we increasing your income by a lot or a little if we go up 25 to 100%? Well, no, a lot. Well, if we do that, doesn't doesn't it seem like we're increasing income a lot? That should actually be a higher risk or a lower risk of running out of money if we do that. No, it should be a higher. It should be a higher risk. Yeah. So uh, if uh, if running out of money should go down, or then if we had our druthers, though, your risk of money, running out of money should go up or down if we increase by that much. It, should, it actually, it would go up, but and then we say, no, 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 but actually, with this technique, it actually will go down. So would you want me to take a look at the 12 methods that work best for your current investments? On a scale of one to five, would you like to know, without changing any of your investments, you wouldn't have to change a single, guys, why do I emphasize without changing a single investment? People don't want to move their investments. We're at the first meeting. Do they want to move their investments? Do they want to change around? People don't like change. So I'm saying, you don't have to change anything without changing any of your investments, just using different techniques. How many people want to know how to increase their income by 25 to 100% and lower their chance of running out of money without changing any of their investments? What percentage of people want to know how to do that? That are retired, what percentage of people? They all do. That's right. They all do. And for those of you that are newer, you might not get this, but those of you that have been on for a while, can we do this? Can we increase their income by 25 to 100%? without changing any of their current investments. Do, do, um, uh, do the, the broker dealers, compliance departments allow us to say this? Do compliance departments, uh, compliance departments allow us to say this? Yes, they do, because we can prove that we can do this. If you don't know how to do it, on the website, you go to click on method and it will take you exactly to how we can do that. So we've given, given them one reason out of five. I, I, they're going to say, uh, on a scale of one to five, we're going to be. They're going to say a five. And again, this is where you would learn how to do it. And, what's, and you can find it here on the website. So now, we've given them, have we given them a reason to come back to that next meeting? Is this a reason that people would come back to the next meeting to find out how to do this? Yes or no? Yes. Then we say, paying less taxes on a scale of one to five, are you interested in how to cut the taxes you pay in your IRA or retirement account by up to 70%? Because right now, when you put money out of your IRA or your retirement account, what percent of that is tax? All of it. How would you like so that you would only would pay 70% less tax? On a scale of one to five, where would you be? What do they all say to that? Or reducing the tax you pay on your investment income. That's your, your income from your investments, not your retirement accounts, because we can reduce that by 70%, but on your non-retirement accounts, we can take you down to just the 1% tax bracket instead of the 25% tax bracket you're in right now. On a scale of one to five, where would you put that? What do they say? Five and five. So now we have three reasons. One, two, three reasons for them to come back. 
And if you don't know how to do that, it's on the website. You would just look here and look here for the explanation. Now, we've already talked about long-term care insurance while we were gathering the data, but I forgot to ask, because they all said they, they didn't want to pay anything. for they, They're scared of long-term care, but they don't want to buy long-term care insurance. So I say, now, we've already talked about that, but I forgot to ask, have you applied for the program that pays for two years of long-term care costs without having to pay expensive annual premiums? Having two years of your shares uh, of your costs covered, so it wasn't going to require you to pay annually or affect how much income you have to spend, where would you put that on a scale of one to five? What is it? Would you like us to run a customized report for you? What do they say? Five. Now we've got four reasons for them to come back. Hey, we've already talked about analyzing your current assets to find out 10 different or 12 different ways to, to withdraw money and give you the highest income with the least chance of running money. So we'll take care of that for you. We'll run those analysis for you. But I forgot to ask, on a scale of one to five, how important is your Social Security income to you? What does everybody say when you ask them how important Social Security is to them? Have you applied for that uh, program that will replace half of your Social Security you'll lose when one spouse dies? When they go to the pearly gates and leave the spouse here on Earth, one less Social Security check comes in and what happens to the income? It goes down. Have you applied for the program that will replace that half of your Social Security? Well, no. What program is that? Oh, so on a scale of one to five, how important is that that we run that customized report for you? Five. So now, how many reasons do they have to come back to see us? So whatever reason they first came to see us, whether the referral, or they were a mailer, or they were a um, um, uh, from a seminar, do they generally come in for five reasons, or do they come uh, come in for one reason? They generally come for one reason, but if we have five reasons for them to come back, how many of them want to come back? Now, again, guys, will, can I say any of these things if I cannot do it? No. So go to the website. Here's how I do it. Go to the website. Here's how we do it. Here's how we do it. Go to the website. Here's how we do it. Go to the website. Here's how we do it. So guys, we can do all these things. Now, are we gonna do all these things? Well, if they need it, yes, but what is the reason we're going through this goal script at the first meeting? What is the reason we're going through this goal script at the, this meeting? To get them to what? Second meeting, right, Andre, get them to come to the second meeting. So look at these things, these goals here. Now, here's the importance of these goals. They've come in for one reason, but now they have five reasons to come back. And here's why these five reasons are so, 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 so important. Why? We're not selling. Instead, they're opting in. They want to come back. We're not selling them on the reason they want to come back. We're saying, we'll run these reports for you if you come back. So they're opting in. Then we have to do the close. In the close, we have to do greed, fear, frustration. We have to have them tell us why they're going to come back. So in the close, I say, super, I'll have those things noted. We'll run those reports for you. We'll actually come back with a report. We'll detail all the benefits you're owed uh, and might not be receiving. We usually find 16 to 21 benefits. That should give you a hint in the report we're going to run. 16 to, that aren't currently aware of what's available to you. And heck, we've already found three or four possibilities. So are you okay with me looking for more? And they say, sure. Now, did you happen to bring your statements? So whether they did or not, it's okay. But I say, Can I, if they did, you say, because uh, we actually have a script for getting them to bring those statements back. Can I take a look at them? We take a brief look. Don't give any opinions or engage in any discussion of investments, just gathering data. Well, that's pretty much all I have uh, the need to begin putting your personalized report together. So a question, a question I have for you is this. Why is it a good thing to go through this control your assets, the CYA process right now, to, for me to run this report to find 1621 benefits? Why would, uh, what good could come from that right now, and I make them tell me. They're gonna tell me, well, you know, if you got 16 ways I can make more money, I'm in I don't need to know about that. If you can show me a way to reduce taxes, you can show, if you can show me a way not to lose half the social security, they're gonna tell us why, why, what good could come from it. And then I say, and what could happen if we waited six months or a year to take a look at these things? Well, what could happen, guys? If we didn't address any of these things, what could happen? Life. And can you do the planning after something's happened? No. So we've addressed greed here. What good can, can happen? 
And what if we address here? What if we wait six months to look at these things and one of these things actually happen? Your spouse died and we didn't have that program in place. You need long-term care and we didn't have those two free years in place. Fear, very good, fear. That's right, fear. And why is it worth your time and a hassle to do it now? I mean, you're, you're here today, you're putting in time today, you may need to answer a couple of follow-up questions if I've missed anything today. You, you may have to go down, you go, go home, dig in your filing cabinet to find a document or two that, that we need to look at. So why is it worth that little bit of hassle and time that you put into the process? See, we're dealing with frustration there because I want them when they go home and then to, to bring the stuff back and then he decides, ah, screw it, it's not even worth it. I want his wife to say what? At the meeting, you said it was worth it to go downstairs and get the, the, uh, the paper. You, it was worth it to drop this stuff back up. You said you were going to do this. See, it, it makes them both commit out, out loud that it's worth a little bit of hassle of going home, maybe answering a few questions, maybe grabbing a, uh, their power attorney out of the filing cabinet and getting it to you or whatever it may be. It's worth that little bit of hassle. We're having them say that out loud. So we've got them greedy. We got them afraid of waiting, and we've said, listen, there's going to be a little frustration or a little work, elbow grease in your part. Why is it worth that elbow grease? So they've, now they've told us that. Super. Well, once I have these documents, it takes about a week to 10 days to get that together for you. So what day the work will next week? They do not leave my office with not, without an appointment. They do not leave my office without an appointment. Does that make sense? Now, if they don't bring in the documents, we actually have a script for that as well. But see, the thing is with the goals, it's a Swiss Army, it, it, we give them five different reasons to come back in. So you've got these five USPs that we talk about over and over and over. These are what get people to come in. These are what close people for a sem at a seminar. These are what close people at a first meeting to get them to go to the second meeting. How well should you know these five different things? Because here's the thing, those five USPs, these are the retirees. These are the, uh, from the study of Age Wave, Ken Dickwell. He asked retirees, what are your concerns? 88% of them said they'd like enough money for financial peace of mind. 74% they said they want investments that provide guaranteed income. 72% said they want a guaranteed investors to guarantee not to lose value. 72% were worried about a serious hospital problem, help make sense of uh, uh, Social Security and Medicare, covering long-term care costs, not being a burden to a family, helping dealing with inheritance legacy matters provide income to my family when I die, health expenses, outliving money. Down here, 20% an investment potential to provide a high return, but a high risk. 12%, I would like to accumulate as much wealth as possible. We don't give a crap about these two things. We care about these things. And what these five concerns, guess what? These USPs address how many of these concerns? 13 out of 13. 13 out of 13. These, can, these five USPs address every single concern retirees have. So if we throw out a, a long net, how many people are going to want you to tell them more? And guys, these USPs, you should be doing what? Talking about them in your newsletters. Talking about them when you're having a barbecue. Making sure you're talking about them when you send out a letter. In your email, when you're doing seminars. Heck, even putting them on, the, on a magnet on your car. The 5Q USP makes getting in front of people much easier. It has two different marketing presentations. If you want to do seminars, we have a tax-focused one, and we have the income-focused one that allows you to do it. So, guys, these are the ways you get in front of people. These are the ways that you get people that you're in front of to move forward. And when you get them to move forward, if you learn the scripts, 100% of people will, will buy in, leave their current advisor, and move to you. Not because I say so, not because you say so, but because the client says so. Out of the 60,000 tapes we have, how many times do we have a client tell themselves 100 times over an hour and a half that their guy was screwing them and not move? Out of 60,000 tapes where, we, where the advisor used the scripts over the last two, 20 years, how many times have we had a client say, yeah, uh, my guy's screwing me, my guy's screwing me, my guy's screwing me 100 different ways, and then at the end not move their money? Make sense? Coolio. So was this helpful to go through the first meeting? Had you, was it a refresher for a lot of you? You hadn't thought about things at that first meeting for a long time? Was this a good thing to do? Awesome. Good, 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 good. Super. 
Well, you guys have. We'll talk to you not next Monday, but the following Monday. Have a very happy Easter. Appreciate you guys. Uh, have a great couple weeks, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, everybody.